Please keep in your prayers uh, Jim Wagoner, who uh, came down ill this morning. So we want to keep him in our prayers. Bill Moore, who returned uh, from the hospital and is at home, so we keep him in our prayers. Kathy Olson, who continues to recover. Uh, Bill Wilkinson, who returned to the hospital yesterday. We want to keep him especially in our prayers as well. And Jill Kresge, um, as she continues with her recovery. And also um, Denise Keeler. Um, uh, she texted me last night that she had fallen and she had hurt her wrist and hands and uh, other things. So uh, we want to keep, you know, certainly keep them in our prayers. Thank you for being here today uh, as we um, worship together, as we begin to open up a little bit more together and. Uh, uh, again, we're looking forward to uh, Pentecost Sunday, which is May 23rd of this month, uh, and we will uh, have a picnic afterwards, but there's a unique spirit in the life of Longwood Hills Church, and we want to celebrate that, uh, a spirit of inclusion and embracing and welcoming um, all people uh, into experience God's love. So at this time, we will start and begin our Facebook Live. Good morning, and welcome to Longwood Hills Congregational Church. We thank you for those who are with us in our sanctuary and those who are joining us uh, online on our Facebook Live page. Uh, just to remind you and lift up and celebrate that as we're celebrating the 25th anniversary of Longwood Hills uh, Congregational Church, we're celebrating many years of, uh, back to 1975, of faithful a service of God's love to, in, to this community. And so we lift that up and celebrate it, and we're reminded that we are an inclusive uh, family of faith uh, and that we welcome all people. And no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, uh, we receive you and welcome you as God image bearer and filled with God's holy breath, and we celebrate uh, you coming and being part of our church life. Uh, today, I want to lift up uh, and celebrate that tomorrow, Lindsay Campbell will turn 25. So, so we want to we want to celebrate uh, with her on her very special day, and uh, know that, uh, and and continue to pray God's blessings uh, upon her. Uh, in her life. I um, want to remind you that on May 23rd, we have, um, which will be, we'll be celebrating Pentecost Sunday, the gift of the Holy Spirit to the church. And we will be having, in, in honor of that, on our anniversaries, the um, uh, Pentecost picnic uh, back out in, in the back uh, lot there. Uh, and so we invite you to come, invite you to bring your, your own food, which at as yet, we'll, be, we'll not be able to share with others. But um, so uh, I'm looking forward to the day that you all can make those deviled eggs and bring them to me. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. We're going to get there. Um, but we can't right now. But come and join us. We had a great time um, with our previous picnic and um, just invite you to be a part of that. I, do, I am so excited to announce to you that uh, in our... AC fund, we are under $11,000. Um, so we, we keep going and we're going to make it. So I thank you all for uh, your generous contributions. Um, we're getting there together. Uh, just have you remember uh, once again, if you have not already done so, our offering is received in the um, box that is located in the lobby area as you leave our worship service this morning. Um, just want to lift up this morning's psalm in our daily readings uh, struck me uh, for this day. Praise the Lord from Psalm 106. Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord for God is good. His love endures forever. Who can proclaim the mighty acts of the Lord or fully declare his praise? Blessed are those who act justly, 
and always do what is right. Let us continue our worship through song. I want to invite you into a time of prayer. As we gather here today, we are so mindful of people who make so many sacrifices on our behalf in our country, in our community, in our church, throughout the world. We give you thanks that for them there is a willingness, a courage to live a life for others, a life that lifts others up, cares for their needs, gives attention for their betterment. 
We pray and give you thanks for doctors and nurses and frontline workers and health care and all who support them so that they may care for those who are ill, continue to be stricken with this virus, stand in the place of loved ones who cannot be with their sick relatives or friends, in many cases hold their hand, allow them to FaceTime, to connect, and hopefully return home, but in far too many cases. They are the ones that stand by their side as they take their last breaths in this world. On behalf of their family, they know that their loved one is not alone. We give you thanks for so many who serve our community, our police, our fire department, our citizens who fill in and do those jobs as well as volunteers and help out. In so many ways, they demonstrate for us the way the way to live our lives that will allow us to experience eternal life, fullness of life, here and now. So we celebrate, give thanks for them this day. We ask you to hear us as we have brought many prayers for our family, friends, our community, our nation and our world trusting that you hear these prayers. You respond with your gracious love and presence. Hear us as we pray. And hear us as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. This our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now I invite Shelly Rose to come forward for our children's message. Hi, friends. I have lots of stuff today that I'm going to talk to you about. So, today... We are talking about renewing our minds. So what exactly does that mean? Well, what it means is what we put in is what we get out. So we know kind of how that works a little bit when we talk about um, being healthy. So when we talk about um, being healthy, we talk about what we put in our bodies. And we kind of know how that works, right? So I want you guys to help me make some really good and healthy choices, OK? I'm going to give you some options. And you're going to have to help me out by giving me a round of applause for the items that you think are the better choice. And, I'll, and I'm going to wave it around in the air so you'll know we're ready. So just give me a minute. All right. It's breakfast time. And I have a couple of choices. I have a great grains cereal that has bananas and heart healthy. And I have Lucky Charms with uh, marshmallows. This is a real choice in my house. I brought these from home, okay? <laughs> so, should I eat Lucky Charms with marshmallows for breakfast? <laughs> Friends. How about Great Grains? There we go. Good job, friends. 
One more healthy choice. All right, again, another option in my house. Um, we have, to help fuel our bodies and give us energy, we have soda, Mountain Dew specifically, okay? Or we have water, okay? All right, friends, Mountain Dew. I have some friends to talk to after this. Or water. Yeah, water, that's much better. So we really understand how to make our bodies healthy, right? That makes sense to us. We, we talk about that a lot, we hear about that a lot. It's on our TV all the time. We hear about it in school sometimes. We know a lot about what makes our bodies healthy. But what about our minds? When we put stuff into our minds, it changes how we behave, the behaviors that we have. Now we know the behaviors that we want to have look like the fruits of the spirit, okay? So what do we need to put into our brains in order to get out the fruits of the spirit? Do my friends remember the fruits of the spirit? You do? Love, love, joy, joy peace, peace, patience, kindness, kindness goodness, goodness, faithfulness, faithfulness gentleness, and self-control. Perfect. So those are our fruits, right? So what do we have to put in to get those behaviors and that out of us? So I'm going to give you some choices, okay? All right. Here we go. We have some downtime, okay? Got two choices here. I've got an Xbox controller. Video games, right? I see you. <laughs> and we also have, this is actually a kid's devotional Bible book, okay? So if we decide we want to get those fruits out of our lives, what do we need to put into our brains to get them out? Do we need to put in more time with our games? Yeah, I thought so. Or what about ta spending time learning more about God and God's story? Yeah, good job, friends. That's right. So I have one more for you. Again, this is our downtime stuff, okay? I have a mess here. Let me take this off. All things at my house, again, <laughs> to mess with. Okay, so we have, this is a, a TV remote. For those of you that still watch regular TV, we do. <laughs> we have TV, or this is my yoga mat. I spend time on my yoga mat to meditate and pray and spend time getting my body kind of just feeling better, okay? So in our free time, if we want to get out those fruits of the spirit, what should we be putting into our minds? TV? Okay. <laughs> I guess sometimes it depends on what you watch, but most of the time, not so much, right? Or should we spend time praying and meditating with our... Good job. So these are just some of the ways that we can start renewing our minds so we can get the fruits of the Spirit out into our lives. And my friends, we're going to talk about more of those ways we can do that in Sunday school. So if you guys will join me in the back and we will go to Sunday school. Thank you, friends. Treasure store, take my. 
Our reading this morning is from Genesis 22, verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, The Lord Will Provide. And to this day it is said, On the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. From Romans first, uh, chapter 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Here ends the reading. Every once in a while, it would be nice if scripture would include the thoughts of Isaac as he was uh, bound, laying there, watching his father raise a knife. (laughs) Seriously, Dad? Thank goodness, a voice from heaven (laughs) to stop this craziness. You know, we're, we're talking about the power of God's story. And in a sense, God's story evolves, or at least our understanding of God's story evolves. And one of the ways that we know that is what we're talking about today, about sacrifice. In our story, we have Abraham being willing to sacrifice his son. Now, on the one hand, that is seen as um, a way to prove his faithfulness to God, that he would go so far as to offer his own and, 
and, and his only child in faithfulness to God, in obedience. It's kind of a horrible story when you think about it, and, and it's one that people who claim not to believe will pick up and say, well, how can you believe in a God that would require human sacrifice in that way? That story of Abraham, it's just, it's oppressive. It's, it's not a good story. But in some ways, we need to look at that story a little bit differently because we realize that Israel lived in a, uh, a, among many cultures, many religions. And some of those religions that Israel came near or was even infiltrated by practiced human sacrifice, child sacrifice. Because sacrifice was a way that we human beings early on figured out how do we get God or this other being or gods to do what we want them to do. You see, vending machines were way back then. You put a certain number of coins in, you pull it, and you get Fritos. Or you get uh, a Mountain Dew, you know, which is probably both of them aren't good for you. But how do we get God to do that? How do we get this, the mysterious to make it rain, to um, allow my wife to become childbearing? How do, we, how do we figure this out? You know, we get more sunshine or, or enough water and our plants grow. How do we do that? And early on, what people had figured out, our ancestors figured out is that you sacrifice to them. And it started uh, with animal sacrifice as well as human sacrifice as, as grotesque and uh, displeasing of a thought that is. And I think in this story was a way for Israel, the Hebrew people, to say to the other cultures, we don't sacrifice humans. We will sacrifice animals in our relationship with God, but we're not going to sacrifice human beings. See, Abraham was told not to. We don't do it. Unfortunately for Israel, as they developed and as they, again, related to other cultures and religions, things infiltrated. And, you know, the Old Testament has recording of people in Israel sacrificing children. It wasn't totally done away with. But it, it started to move the needle, right? We went from human beings to animals in sacrifice. And then I believe one of the critical moments, the tipping point was when after Jesus' death and resurrection, Animal sacrifice continued in the temple until the Romans in 70 AD came and destroyed the temple in Israel because of uprisings, or Jerusalem, I should say. And in that was basically the end of animal sacrifice in, in, in a large measure. It probably was continued to be practiced. Now, Israel, as we said last week, Scripture has this incredible way of having counterpoints to it. So you have the practice of sacrifice, but you also have voices within the faith, usually from prophets who, who are kind of on, a, they're critics, kind of on the peripheral, but they, they are bringing a different side for people to look at. And they begin to lift up what are we doing here? God doesn't want this. And so Hosea, the prophet, in chapter 6, verse 6, says, For I desire, speaking on behalf of God, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, the acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. Psalm 50, another voice that is counter the animal sacrifice. And I love this, Psalm 50. On behalf of God, this is what God says, I have no need of bull from your stall. <laughs> I love that line. <laughs> when I read that in daily, man, it just jumped. I have no need of bull. 
It's got more than one meaning. You get it, you know, right? You know, it gets how we are as human beings. I, I have no need of bull from your stall or goats from your pens. For every animal in the forest is mine, God says, and, and the cattle on the thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains and the insects in the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all that's in it. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? There's this other voice in Israel that's saying, folks, we got to stop this. There's something wrong here. Not only should we not be sacrificing human beings, but what are we doing in sacrificing animals? It's a view that everything is of God. Why are we sacrificing? What result do we hope to get? Because it's all external, right? It's like the guy that goes and, and or the person that goes and to fulfill their anniversary uh, celebration goes into the, you saw that ad years ago, the guy went in and, and he got himself at the convenience store a six-pack of beer on his way home and he noticed these cards that were on the counter there and man, the first one he picked up said, happy anniversary, that's good enough for me. He didn't even bother to read it. He fulfilled what he had to do to keep peace at home, supposedly, right? Honey, I, I got you a card. I remembered, along with my six-pack, <laughs> thank God, the cards were there on the counter. See, that's what happens. You know, we, we, it's all external. Listen to what <clears throat> Isaiah 11. I take that back. It's Isaiah 1, verse 11. I, I, listen, listen. The multitude of your sacrifices, this is Isaiah the prophet. What are they to me? Says the Lord. I have more than enough burnt offerings of rams and fat of fatted animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. This is countercultural. There's a whole business of animals by the time Jesus, one of the reasons that he clears out the um, money changers is that there's a whole business there. You've got to buy our animals. You can't bring in your own poor people. I'm sorry. Your bird isn't good enough. You've got to buy the one from the stadium. I'm playing with that a little bit, Okay. Your incest is detestable to me. New moons and Sabbath and convocations. I cannot bear your, your evil assemblies. Your new moons and festivals and your appointed feast, my soul hates. Can you imagine what the people who listened to that, who heard that first time, would thought? They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. And so he provides a picture of what doing right is. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. This is right out of the shoot, folks. Isaiah 1. So there's this criticism of this whole practice of sacrifice. And, and by the time of Jesus, Jesus even quotes the words of that Hosea 6, verse 6, when he says, learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You've you got to stop 
superficially paying me honor. Up, oh, you know, I sacrificed a ram, a bull, that was expensive, and it couldn't be just any bull, it had to be perfect. That was very costly. Now I can go home, it's done, right? Now, it's just like here. We come here, and, and I'm glad that you're here. We worship God, and we think we're making points with God. And then we go out and do whatever we want. Hey, I was at church. I got a clean bill. I'll wait till next Sunday. I'm being facetious, right? But in a way, not too facetious. So what is Jesus doing? He begins to change that whole dynamic of sacrifice. What, how is this world going to change? We've got to stop superficially sacrificing out here, and then we have to internalize it in here. So Paul states, right? Make yourselves a living sacrifice. How do we do that? Well, again, God has given us just the best example of all, right? In Jesus. Watch his life. Read the story. What did he do? He was constantly reaching out for other people. And, and because Jesus comes from the community of the Trinity of other-centered self-giving, Father to the Son and Spirit, Son to the Father and Spirit, Spirit to the Son and the Father, continually, never asking for anything back, but in the act of giving to others, they discovered that they're filled. They're filled. Our gospel story that was read this morning from Matthew 19 is the story of, of the rich young man who comes up to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, do the commandments. And he picks out all of the ones that treat people. He doesn't say anything about Lord, love the Lord your God. He doesn't say anything about worship, not worshiping other gods. He starts off with do not lie, do not steal, do not murder, do not bear false witness. That'd be lying too, so that's, I'm redundant there. Um, honor your father and mother, I said that too. I'm trying to help me out here. Come on. Um, I, I, and then he says, love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man says, well, I've done all that. And Jesus said, yeah, but something's missing. Go and sell everything you have. Give it to the poor because that's how you make connection. Your sacrifice, what's really important for you, sacrifice that. And you'll have eternal life in the sense of a fullness. Don't we say that when we talk about getting in and serving people and people get done with it, whatever it is, a food pantry or, or a, you know, a, a thing that we do in the community and we go, wow. We work at a Habitat for Humanity house, we go, wow. You know what? I did something for somebody else, but I got more. Don't we say that? I got more. Because I did that. And so the reality of what that other-centered self-giving, you know, the truth of it is we don't have anything to fear. We can do that, and we'll get it back multiple times. And anyone who's ever been involved in any kind of service understands that deeply. You know, there's all kinds of examples around us, and I, I've used this before, but I think it bears lifting up. There was, uh, some of you were alive in 1982. You remember Flight 90, Florida Air Flight 90, taking off from Washington, D.C. airport. Very snowy, wet conditions, cold. The plane was not de-iced enough. And as it took off, it could not gain enough altitude, and then it ended up descending, slamming into the 14th Street Bridge, cutting the tail off. Over 70 people lost their lives. And the people on the bridge who were sitting there in traffic also lost their lives. But there was a section of the tail, of the tail section, where there were like, Five people alive, four or five, uh, five or six people alive. 
And they were down in that icy water. And people gathered to try to help them and do whatever they could. But man, that, 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 that water was so cold, they couldn't swim out there. But the helicopter got there, and the, the helicopter had this life-saving, lifesaver um, float device that it descended to the passengers. And there was this one man that always caught it, and he gave it to somebody. And three people were taken out in that first. It came back, and... It went down, and that man grabbed it again and gave it to another passenger. And that person was taken, and, and they fell into the water, and one of the bystanders, who also happened to be a firefighter, jumped into the water, swam out to get him, risking his life. And he almost didn't make it back, but he brought that person back in. And they needed help from the shore. But the helicopter trying to help that didn't make it back out quick enough. And when he went back out to lower that life-saving device once again, that man who passed it to other people couldn't be seen. You see, that's the sacrifice. Make yourselves living sacrifices. You don't have to give your life. You have to lose your life. But I mean, you've got to lose your ego a little bit, right? So that other people can be lifted up, can be helped. So that 14th Street Bridge, I'm sorry, it happened so long ago, I saw it on TV and I still get upset when I read this. The 14th Street Bridge was renamed to the Arlen D. Williams Jr. Memorial Bridge. What is it about us that we witness such noble life-giving? And man, it's not very long and we forget. 9-11 happened. We as a nation, as a people, witnessed incredible self-sacrifice. People running into a building that other people were trying to get out and doing it because that was their job. But they didn't have to do it, right? They went in there willingly. And most of them didn't make it out. And we have all these examples. Our church, the church I served at that time, took in... Weeks after that, the largest number of new members we ever had. And one year later, not one of those new members was still a member. Because they found out, my gosh, I joined a church. <laughs> I got a sacrifice. They want something from me. Yeah, that's kind of how it is. If you really want something great, if you want to do something great, you're going to sacrifice. If you want to be 89 years old and healthy and strong and vibrant, you might do 50 push-ups at a time in the morning. You want to have a great praise band? You got to practice. They got to sacrifice the time and put in because they don't want to look like slobs on Sunday morning. They want it to go well. They want it to sound well. You want a great church? You got to sacrifice. You got to put yourself in. You got to give of yourself. You got to join the effort. You can't just sit back. One of the worst things I ever did as a minister was we bought this whole lie that somehow young people didn't want to be asked for money. And so when we had a contemporary service, we wouldn't pass the plate. We might offend them. And they wouldn't come back because that's all the church wants is your money. Guess what? Our first service, which was a mixed service, much like ours, supported the church. But because we didn't ask the second service for money, but we, we had a receptacle out there, give if you want. They barely supported the church. And as a minister, I lied to them. I said, you know what? 
You can be part of this grand kingdom that God, and never have to sacrifice. One of the translations of that Old Testament story of Abraham and Isaac is Isaac is walking up and he says to his father, Father, we have the, we have the sticks and we have the fire, but where is the sacrifice? In this interpretation, it said, where is the lamb? In other interpretations, where is the sacrifice? Saying, where is it, folks? We can't lie. You can't have a great marriage without two people sacrificing for you. You're not going to be a great... Next week is Mother's Day, right? You're not going to be a great mom or dad without sacrificing. And it doesn't mean you lose your life. You lose your ego. And you begin to live for somebody else. And yeah, you know, so the, the, the rich young man said, what do I do to discover the secret to life? And Jesus said, get yourself out of the way. And then serve others. He went away. Now I have to tell you, I don't really think that a lot of people are so self-centered and selfish that that's, I think that all of that is motivated by something else, honestly, by fear. I'm afraid that if I give and I sacrifice, there won't be any more left for me, so I got to keep it. And that's what we're dealing with. You know, and it's sad. Why is it after World War I, after World War II, People in this nation rose up after 9-11. People rose up and they were together and made whatever sacrifice needed to make to make it together. But we have a pandemic that takes 200 and over 260,000 of our fellow human beings in this nation away and yet people want to say, no, it's about me and my rights. Why should I do anything for anybody else? We're not doing it. We're doing it for each other. We're doing it, and in doing it for each other, whatever we're asked to do, we benefit. Because it's almost over. We're getting there. We just got to hang on a little bit longer, and then this church can be filled. And, you know, you don't have to come in here looking like you're going to rob a bank. I mean, I love that. You can walk into a bank with a mask on and nobody questions you anymore. No? We won't have to do that. I can't wait for that day in this church because we're a hugging church. Won't it be great to shake hands again? Won't it be great to give each other hugs again? Let us pray. Wondrous God, Truly, you gave us your son, not holding back to show us how deeply you love us, how deeply you care for us, how deeply you want us to experience life. And then in his life, you showed us the way to live a deep, meaningful, and joyful life as we give ourselves in sacrificial ways to each other. And the mystery of all mysteries, the secret is that in giving ourselves away, we find that we have more than we started with. And that's your promise. And that's the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. sacrifice May all I do bring praises unto you In the light of your unending mercy In light of your unfailing love Here's my life a living sacrifice for will be
Let's go forth into this week living out the example of Jesus, caring for one another, lifting each other up, and experiencing that miracle of miracles that when we do that, we find our own lives enhanced, deepened, and joyous. As you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lead you with goodness this day and always. Amen. This will be my worship. This will be my worship. The way I live. The way I serve. And this will be my worship. This will be my worship. The way I live for you. Oh, and this will be my worship. This will be my worship. The way I live. The way I serve. And this will be my worship. This will be my worship. The way I live.